So we've shown you how to store elements in the DOM as cached element references, right? We use any one of the selectors that we've shown you to be able to find an element in our HTML and save it as a variable. We've shown you how to adjust certain properties of that. That's what we went over this morning and a little bit yesterday. And the, everything is going to start kind of coming together and clicking now because what we're going to do is we're going to attach events and event listeners to things. And that's what is going to allow us to have like interconnected functionality. So, you know, we've had all this, all these examples so far about, okay, select an element. We want to change this text content. When do we do that? Right. We're going to do that either when we submit a form or when we click on something, or we have to make some sort of user interaction, right? When we get to react, that's what react is, right? It's a bunch of components. It's a UI framework, essentially, where you're creating a place for users to interact with their, um, the application that they're using. And before we get into the complexities of React, we have to teach you how to do it here in JavaScript, the easy way. Uh, and to do that, we need to know how events work. What are events? How do we handle attaching what are called event listeners to things? How do we listen for events? Um, the stuff that is in this lecture, like the content here is it's like absolutely critical that you master quickly because you're going to need to use it for the rest of this unit, like daily, realistically. Um, we're going to talk about how to make things happen when you interact with your web page. And that's really what the rest of this unit is about, right? Can't make a game if you can't interact with your web page. So let's go ahead. We got 59 mouse clicks. I'm going to go ahead and get set up here. Uh, but we're going to talk in this lecture about how to add event listeners for things like click. Uh, we're going to talk about the event object. We're going to explain event bubbling. We're going to use event bubbling to implement event delegation. And we are going to stop an event, uh, an event from bubbling. So let's go into our lectures directory. Uh, lectures. And we will create a directory called events practice. CD into that. And let's go ahead and touch index.html. And we also need a JavaScript directory because that's where our JavaScript is going to live. So mkdir.js. And we will touch inside of the JavaScript directory a file called app.js. Let's go ahead and open that in VS Code. And that, of course, popped up right behind my Zoom window. Okay, let me move you down. And let's go ahead and put our script tag in here so that we can link JavaScript to our file, our HTML file. So there's our boilerplate. Why is that? There we go, much better. Let's go ahead and put our script tag in here. Source is going to be slash JS app.js and make sure we put defer. This is going to be called events DOM events. And let's go inside of our JavaScript file and set up a sanity check just to make sure we're loading everything properly. So we'll console log sanity check. Nothing different than what we've done countless times before. Let's go live. And we should see sanity check. Cool. Oh, look at that. By the time I was done with setup, I had enough people that clicked on the mouse. You guys have made it. You all graduate. You all pass. You can go home now. Cool. All right. Oh, this is such a fun lecture. So what are DOM events? DOM events are the, well, the way we have it described here, the bedrock of interactivity on web pages. Um, they're going to let us implement what is called event-driven programming, which is really what unit one is all about in the end. Um, 
This programming paradigm is such that much of our code runs in response to events triggered during runtime by the user. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so there are tons of different events that are being generated within the browser. When you move your mouse, when you click your mouse, when you press a key, when you submit a form, uh, when the page finishes loading, when the page is resized, there are so many different events that are happening without you even realizing it. And we can take a look at those here. So I'm going to go uh, full screen with this one real quick so we can see some of these. But these are all the different types of events that we've got. And these are all like subcategorized. Like there's, let's look at uh, mouse events, right? Mouse event. So these are all the different events that have to do with a mouse, right? This is just mouse events. All these different things, right? Um, did they change the way this list looks? Uh, let's see, keyboard events. So keyboard.key, shift key, all, for all sorts of fun stuff. Um, you definitely want to take a look at a lot of these. Um, explore this list, get pretty intimate with it, because you're going to be using at least a handful of these things throughout your, uh, your applications. Uh, there's a clipboard API. You can copy and paste things to your clipboard if you have the right code for it. Um, actually, Hunter ended up using that when he helped implement functionality in our uh, Clippy app, which we're going to show you a little bit later this afternoon. Uh, there are a ton of different events here. And um, here's some input ones. So you've got a whole bunch of events based on input tags, right? all sorts of different stuff. So we're going to talk about a, a handful of the important ones today. Most importantly is going to be click. Uh, and I'll be able to show you a list, a more specific list of all of the events that we have access to when we do some console logging here in a minute. So, oh, that's right. Cool. So what is an event listener? If we're going to, if we have all these events happening around us all the time when we're inter interacting with our browser, how do we listen for them? How do we do something when an event happens? Um, specifically, we're going to use a callback function to handle being able to access that event object. And to do that, it's going to be uh, a couple of different ways to do that. The first, which you may have seen before, is this little on click uh, attribute that you can give an element. Uh, I think this was in your pre-work, right? Where you guys had to use the on click for something. Yes. Okay. Um, that's one method of registering an event listener. You can also assign properties using the on click property of a DOM element if you wanted to do it that way. But the way that we're going to do it is using add event listener. We're going to talk about why here. So using the HTML approach, the on click equals like run this function whenever something is clicked is typically frowned upon because it requires that function to be in the global scope, uh, which they're not always going to be. In addition, uh, this kind of breaks the whole separation of concerns principle, right? We want our functions and our JavaScript file. That's where our JavaScript belongs. We don't want our functions. We don't want JavaScript hanging out inside of our HTML file. So in order to separate those concerns, we're going to write things purely in JavaScript. The DOM element approach, adding an on click to an element, is a little bit better um, because the function doesn't necessarily have to be in the global scope. But add event listener is going to be the best because it has the flexibility of adding multiple event listener functions. So we'll actually be able to use multiple uh, multiple listeners, which is kind of kind of important. So this. Right here is the syntax. If we were to go to MDN, uh, which I will show you here. So, you'll see here. That we have the syntax right here. Type and listener. Okay. So 
type is a case sensitive string representing the event type to listen for. The one we're going to start with is click. We're going to listen for a mouse click. Uh, the listener is the object that receives the notification. Um, you're going to see more about this. Uh, and we're going to be putting a callback function here. We all know what callback functions are still, right? Still remember what a callback function is? What's a callback function? Function within a function. Easy peasy, right? Cool. Um, the other thing that we have here is use capture. That's a Boolean. It's optional. It has stuff to do with event phases. We're not going to talk about that in SEI, but if you want to read more about it, there's an article here. You can check that out. So this callback right here is essentially going to be the function that we use, that we execute whenever the event that we're listening for occurs. So if I write an event listener that listens for a mouse click, whenever I click on something that this listener has been attached to, this callback function will fire. That's the basics of how an event listener works. We're going to add an event listener to an element to listen for an event. And whenever that event occurs, we're going to execute a callback. I'm going to say that one more time because this is really, really, really friggin' important. Okay. We're going to add an event listener to an element. That event listener is going to listen for whatever the event name is that we give it. We'll start with click, or we'll end up seeing a couple of them, but we're going to listen for a mouse click. And whenever we click, the callback function that we pass to this event listener is going to fire. We're going to run the code inside of that function. That's how event listeners work. So let's let's get work. Oh, this is such an exciting moment for all of you writing our first event listener. I'm so I'm so happy. Let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to close that, leave that open. Let's go ahead and add some HTML. So let's go into our index and paste this inside of the body. Oh, that formatting is horrible. Oh, no, wrong button. There we go. That's a little bit better. So you see here, what we've got is an H3, it says comment. We have a UL with a U, uh, excuse me, with an LI inside of it. We have an input field right here. And we have a button for add comment. Obviously, button doesn't do anything because we haven't tied anything to it, but it exists. We can see it. Okay. What we want to do, our goal here, is when we hit that add comment button, we want to create a new comment with the text that lives inside of this input field. And then we want to clear the input field. So if I type in uh, comments, uh, horses are terrifying, and I hit add comment, what I want to happen is as an li element within this ul element that you can't really, ooh, can't really see, I want this to show up as an li element inside of this ul. So I want another one of these li's to say horses are terrifying. That's our goal for this little exercise. Okay, everybody understand the scope of what we're, what we're doing? That's yes, not very difficult. Sounds difficult right now because you don't know how to do it, but you will. Okay, so let's do it. Let's add our first event listener. In order to add an event listener, we need an element, right? Our JavaScript is noticeably bare right now. All we have is a console log, which we can get rid of because we saw that it's set up and runs, right? So let's use what we've learned to be able to target one of our elements, right? We have a bunch of different options. Do we have any IDs here on our button? No. So we can't use get element by ID. What can we use? Query selector. Query selector works. I Query just look for the get look for element button. by event. Mm, you don't want to get element. By event. Say that again. Uh, get um, by element. Uh, we're just going to use query selector. It's one of the magic magic three, right? Query selector, query selector all, and sometimes get element by ID. 
So we're going to go with query selector because that's going to return one element that matches whatever the criteria are that we specify. Cat? I would okay. I was thinking input, but well, we're we're gonna want to click on the button, not on the input, right? We're gonna need one for the input eventually, but not quite yet. Kat, what's your question? Uh, yeah, I was just thinking with like whether we select get element by ID or query selector or query selector, all of that also plays into like upfront when you're before you write the code and you're thinking about, I guess, the whole architecture, right? Like in, in this case, we just have like one button, but like if eventually you have more than one button, you don't want to use query selector, right? Exactly. Okay, just checking. Yep. It's something you have to think about and it's something you have to plan out as you're building your applications. It's a cool, very, cool. very good point. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's something you'll find that sometimes you're going to end up refactoring over the course of building an app because you'll build something that you're like, well, I'm going to start off with this, but oh crap, I got to add a button. So how am I going to differentiate between my buttons? Maybe I'll give one of them a different, you know, a couple of them are classes that deal with difficulty or uh, when we learn about event bubbling, you'll be able to learn how to handle different ways of handling that too. Because sometimes you don't even need to put a, an event listener on the button. I know it's yeah. like crazy. Yeah, I'm just stuff. wondering if it's like bad practice to do this route or like, or like if it's cleaner practice to tag all of them. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. This is your okay. literal first example. So I'm not going right. to throw 15 things at you at once, but. Right. I do. I appreciate the fact that you want to plan these things out ahead of time. We'll talk more about that. Cool, cool. Cool, cool. Good observation. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to write our first event listener. Let's go ahead and stub this up. We can select this element by using query selector because there's only one button on the page. So we can just use button. So let's do that. Let's call, let's say const button equals document dot query selector, just QS, and we're looking for a button. What's the first thing you think I should do? Console log button. Exactly. Log it. Yes, exactly. There it is. Oh, perfect. Our, our cached element reference is, is working properly. Love it. Um, Always, 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 always console log this stuff at the beginning, y'all. I know I've said that like 20 times now today, but please, please, please do that. Um, cool. So we have our cached element reference set up. As far as naming these things go, uh, you can use whatever convention you want, as long as you're following a couple of rules. One, it needs to make sense. I wouldn't call this banana sandwich because this is not a banana sandwich. This is a button. Right? I could call it add button. I could call it comment button. I could call it button since we only have one button. Button makes sense. I could call it button. If I can spell. I could call it like that. I could do however I want, right? As long as what I'm calling it makes sense and is lower camel case. We're going to stick with button. You'll find uh, a lot of the convention that I use when I write code is to shorten things, right? If I'm using a uh, like if I use class names or ID names, I'm going to be very specific in the HTML. And then I'll use a shortened version of it in my JavaScript. So for example, you might see, uh, use something like if I have an input that has an ID of, uh, I don't know, message, right? And I get that inside of my code by doing const message div or message L equals, and I would abbreviate it something like that. Whatever convention you use, as long as it makes sense, as long as it's lower camel case, you're going to be good to go. So don't, don't worry about that too much quite yet. Uh, just make sure that you stay consistent. That's the most important thing with that. So now that we have our button, we can, we can finally do it. Let's do it. Let's add our event listener. So we're going to say button dot. And if we just start typing add event listener, you're going to see it pop up. Okay, I'm going to hit tab. I'm going to open my parentheses. And before I do anything else, I'm going to stub up the rest of this event listener function. Before I type any, any of the meat and potatoes inside of the function, I'm just going to get it all stubbed up. OK, 
Okay. So I want to listen for a click and then I want to execute a callback function. So I'm going to type function, open my parentheses or my curly brackets and stub that up. This is how you need to write your functions until you get more experienced with, okay, I'm going to put this in as a uh, parameter and then stub it up just by putting it as simple as you can then go back and fill out whatever your parameters are and start filling out the, the inside of your function. Okay. If you take a break, like, oh, well, I got to put EV, just now, just stub it up first, then go back and fill everything out so that you get your syntax done properly. Because if you miss one of these things, you're just going to have a, a pain of a time trying to fix it. Uh, Christopher. Yes, I noticed that when you don't, in the source, when you're linking your JavaScript file, if you don't have defer, it does not work. And then when you hover over it, it's, I'm, I'm not really understanding. Like, I guess I'm just wondering why, why do you need the defer there to make the event add sure. listener to work? Um, what this will do, you're, this is going to load your JavaScript before the page loads. So it's gonna load it at the start rather than at the end. So this is just saying, hey, load all my JavaScript first. If you don't do that, your event listers aren't going to work properly. We covered that in, uh, uh, Shazad covered that when we talked about setting up your JavaScript files. So I, we can link you more docs on that if you want at some point. Actually, if one of the instructors would shoot something into the channel, that would be fantastic. We're talking about the, the reason why we write defer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm on it. I got, I got a, a whole essay about it. I figured. Awesome. Um, so, all right, back to where we were. Um, so we have this function now. This, this is our callback function, right? Right here. That's a function. It's a function within this method, which is a function. Function and a function is a callback function. Okay. One of the things that this gets passed when we execute it is the event object. It's just how this works. Whenever we execute this function, this event listener, part of the callback function is going to be the event object that gets passed to it. It's just, that's how it works. So what we can do is why don't we console log what event is, and let's take a look at it. Just to see what that event object looks like. So if I click on add comment, oh, there it is. There's our first event. Holy cow. Look how long that is. Look at, all, look at all that data I just got from a mouse click. It's telling me where the, the X and Y coordinates of the mouse on my screen. Uh, the type was click. Uh, all this different info. Oh, target. Target was the button. Oh, my God. I have all the info about the target. This is all CSS stuff, right? The inner HTML of my target was add comment. Look at all this stuff, this info I had access to from that event object, right? See why this might be useful? If I want to change the property of something by clicking on it, I can use the event target, which is what this is. Event.target shows me the thing that I clicked on which is what we're going to be doing here in a little bit. Darn out. Yeah, my my console.log event is not working. I don't know why. Looks Everything looks to be in order. Did you console uh, log your button when you set up your cached element reference? Console log the button. If you do this. I'm doing it now. Let's see here. It's not working. Uncaught reference error. Pretty sure I set up my JavaScript, right? I'll put the HTML and JavaScript in the browser that are in the Slack there. Do you want to just share your screen real quick? We could probably debug this. Yeah. Did quick. you click add comment? Do what now? Go ahead and share your screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, app.js line two, button is not defined. 
See that error right there? This is yeah. your this is your gold right here. So let's take a look at app.js line two. You're trying to console log button, but you have button. Ah, uh, wrong button. Oh, shoot. Cool, so you've got your button. Now yeah. let's take a look at your event listener. That should work if you click on that button. You don't need to console log anything, just click on your button. Oh, yeah. Yep. There you go. Okay. That's okay. All right. Yeah. I just, I guess I missed when you clicked on the actual button to bring it up in console log. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's okay. So that's it. That's it. We've seen our first event object, right? We're going to be using that for all sorts of stuff. Um, moving forward and you're going to get to see some really really cool ways to use it so let's answer some questions and then we'll talk a little bit more about the event object we're gonna pick random people here are your questions what is the name of the method used to attach event listeners to elements what is the method's signature i.e the method's name number and type of arguments and what it returns and then three events that might be triggered in the browser I noticed that somebody always disconnects right before I get the student picker out. We're going to have to see if that's a consistent connection problem. All right. Edwin, what's the name of the method used to attach event listeners to elements? Is Edwin there? Yeah, I have myself on mute. Sorry. What was the first question? Right here. What's the name of the method used to attach event listeners to elements? Um, Only method we've used so far. The add event listener? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Second question, what is that method's signature? This is the tricky question, right? What's the name, number, and type of arguments, and what it returns? Okay. Ilya. Uh, yes, so um, what's the signature? So the method's name is at the event place in there, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the number and type of arguments uh is it only one argument or it can be more oh it's three. Oh no it's uh it's three arguments right potentially it's it accepts up to three we're up only gonna to use two of those arguments yes so the first one uh is the type of event mm -hmm. And the second one is a callback function. Okay. And the third one, use capture, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't, need, don't need to worry about that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And what is returned when we ex when this event listener runs? Uh, it it returns uh, event. I, the like the object that describes the event that happened. Yep, it's right, going to pass. Right. It's going to pass that to the callback function. Yes, exactly. To the callback function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And our third question: Name three events that might be triggered in the browser. Happy. Um. Oh my god. Three Hello, events. Low hanging fruit. What's the first one we just did? Like clicking, clicking the button. There's one. Um, maybe console log, like the function. What are ways that I can interact with this? 
type, web page. Type, type typing. In. That works. Okay. Key press. Yeah. That's one. What's the third one? And is it what we have to do like with the text going where SER rocks is? Uh, that's not necessarily an event. That's a function that we're going to tie to it. Think of ev events as just things that happen, right? If I move the mouse, that's an event. If I click on something, that's an event. If I right click on something, that's an event. If I type something, that's an event. Every key keystroke I press is an event. All those different things are examples of events. And you're going to see a whole bunch more as time goes on. Cool. Excellent work. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more of about the uh, event object. Unless anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer questions before we move on. Sweet. So, oh, boots. Sorry, I'm just having a an error. I see, it seems that I'm I have the the same HTML that you would do, but maybe we can just examine it. All Let's take a look. I'm getting a, a add event listener is not a function issue. Mm, probably didn't declare your um, cached element reference properly, or something's not being found. So uh, you want to use query selector, not query selector all. Ha! Huh. Thank you. Yep. How come you can't use query selector all? Like, wouldn't it just return the, the one button that's there? As what type of data structure? What type of data structure does uh, query selector all return? You remember that one? It's a Boolean, right? Or no? An so array. An array like object. Uh, an array like object. It's called a node list. And you can't attach an event listener directly to a node list. We That's will right. see how to do that though, eventually. So, well, how to get around that. So, um, that's because one of the properties of an array no, or a, a node list is that it is iterable. So we can loop over it. So, cool. All right, let's take a look at this event again. Um, you saw that we had access to the X and Y properties where the mouse click happened. So I saw that here, right? X, Y. Uh, not sharing screen. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry can sorry. you share your screen? Yeah. yeah. There we go. Sorry. So we'll do that again here. Okay. Click the button. We open up that event that we're console logging. And you can see down here, we have access to the X and Y position of the click, right? You can see where on the page I clicked. Um, you have the target property. Target property is huge. You're going to use that all the time. It's really, 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 really useful to know what the thing is that you are clicking on. Um, and uh, there's a little note here that JavaScript's this keyword within the listener will be set to the DOM element that add event listener, listener was called on. So that's just a fun little side note. But let's, let's do this. Let's console log event.target because I just told you how important target was. And let's see what happens if we click on that button again. Let me get rid of this console log. That's the target. It's pretty handy, right? I click on something, showing me the target of what I clicked on. How might this be applicable in a game that you build? Give me a for instance. Make sure what you think is happening is what is actually happening when it's clicked on. Yeah. Somebody give me an example of how you might use this in a game. Could it be like attacking an enemy or something? My yeah. sense that. Exactly. If I click on a big troll, right, and I want to swing at the troll with my great axe of hindering, then I click register that attack. And would, would I mean, there's obviously a lot more that goes on here, but there would probably be a troll object. And the assuming I hit, there would have to be some sort of random modifier determining whether or not I hit the uh, hit the troll, because you know, trolls sometimes they're tough to hit, I guess. And uh, 
if I hit the troll, I roll to see how much damage damage I roll. Wow, I'm talking like D and D. There would have to be some sort of function to determine what kind of damage I do with my great axe of hindering, and then that troll's hit points would be decreased. Right? That's an example. Cool. So, uh, a little bit simpler. Tic tac toe. Right? If I click on a square. I need to know what square I'm clicking on to be able to put an X or an O in it, right? That's a, that's a whole lot simpler than the great X of hindering. So um, anyway, you, you guys smell what I'm saying? Ah, I almost said it again. Wow. OK, I didn't say it, though, all the way. It counts, Ben. It counts. <laughs> I'm going to have to like burn into yeah, I enjoyed opens. the great X of hindering dialogue, <laughs> personally. I thought that was a great example, personally. Perfect. Um, so do you guys understand what I'm saying? You, you feel me? Like, do you understand why this is important? Yes, why it's useful, how we're going to use it. We have to listen for events. We're going to tie those events to functions. OK, so what you're going to see eventually is that this function right here doesn't necessarily have to be written like this. It can be a named function. So we can actually just, you know, if we have a function called swing at troll or whatever, right? Oh, you wouldn't want to do that. We'd have a function down here called swing at troll that would be executed when we click. And just for funsies here, let's do this. Let's see if this works. Let's pass event in because we know that that function should accept the event object as a parameter. And let's say console log dot target. Let's see if that works. Hot damn, that's cool, right? So we just took that function, that whole like, oh, that's just so much cleaner code, right? So we know that when we click our button, we're swinging at a troll. That's an example of using a named function instead of an anonymous one to clean up your code. I'm pretty sure we do that in this lesson, but it's prettier. I've never written a function called swing at troll before. That was pretty cool. Zuri. Ben, I'm sorry. I didn't get the metaphor because I don't know that game. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to visualize what you're saying, and I, I need another metaphor, please. OK. Um, Possible. I am looking at a uh, screen of, uh, how about say we're, we have a field of daisies and pansies, right? Field of flowers. And I am wanting to pick a flower. So my function could be when I click on a flower, tell me which flower I'm clicking on. Right? And then do something with it. I would have in that situation, I could have a function called uh, function pick flower. And and here, whenever I click on my button or whatever I have the event listener set on, it would pick a flower. So the big picture is that you can tie a function to what happens when you interact with a, an element in the DOM. That's the big picture thing. It's not, it's not necessarily whether we're picking flowers or swinging at trolls. It's, it's, it's that we tie an event to a function. We execute this function when we interact with an object or when we interact with an element. Got it, thank you. Cool. cool. All right, so how do, we, how do we do this? What do we do from here, right? We have the ability to detect that event. How do we do something useful with that? Right now, I just have data. I don't, I'm not actually doing anything, right? I'm just console logging the data out. Um, the, uh, let's see here, what's next? If we want to add a new comment, we have to add an li element, OK? Because that's what we want to do. We want to add whatever I type in here into an li element. And then we're going to use code to take that li element and pop it into the ul element that we've got, OK? So to do that, we're going to need to create a new HTML element. We haven't done that before. We can do that in JavaScript. You can do anything with JavaScript. So what we're going to do is inside of this function, 
instead of just console logging our event target, let's get rid of that. Let's make a new li. Say const li equals, and we can use document dot create element. And as a string, we're going to pass to it the name of the element that we want to create, which in this case would be an li. Let's start by console logging it, make sure it worked. Okay. I absolutely hate the name li. I'm going to call it new li because I think that's more descriptive. And that way you don't get confused. That's better. Okay. So we're making a new li using this document.create element. When I click this button, you'll see our li. That's the new one that we just created. If I want to add text to that, how do I do that? Text content. Let's try it. New li dot, you said text content equals Daisy. Now I click on my button. And I have an li with Daisy. Cool. That's step one. Right now, that's only in memory, right? This doesn't exist anywhere on our page. We have to put it there. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to have to use, well, we're going to have to do a couple things first. Right now, we're just randomly putting in a string. We're going to need to actually type something in and have it take that data from the input field, right? So let's scrap that. And why don't we, you know, I think would be a better approach is why don't we make uh, some pseudocode for what we need to do, right? That's what we should have been doing from the start. One of you instructors, can you make a note that we should probably add pseudocode to this lesson to be more informative? Thank you. Let's do it. What do we need to do? We need to get the value of the input or get the, I'm going to put it like this because we don't know what value is yet. Get the text from the input, input field and assign it to when we've already determined that we need text content of new li. Then we need to attach, there's a much better word for that, but again, haven't seen it yet, so I'm not gonna use it. Attach the new li to the ul element we have, right? That seems like a good, a good place to go. That's a good set of steps, right? If you're ever confused about where to go, where to start with your functions and where you're with your methods and where your event listeners, just type it out. Think through it before you start writing code. You're not going to be able to just write code like from scratch without having to think about it first. And when you're thinking about it, just write down your thoughts and comments. It's what we all do. It's going to help you get there faster. Okay. So we have the new li element. We've created it to a new variable. Again, I'm calling it new li because that makes more sense to me. Um, we have to get whatever text the user has typed into the input element and then store it in a variable. Okay. Mike. Yeah, I did it before for guess the number game. Um, and what I used is I used the, that value of the, the input. That's exactly what we're going to do. Hit the nail on the head. So we made our new li, right? Why don't we get another cached element reference for our input field so we can access its value, right? So get the text from the input field, okay? So why don't we say const input equals, and we can use our query selector again, because we only have one input field. So let's say document dot, uh, what was that? Query selector QS or SQ apparently. 
and we're looking for input. That's the first thing we're going to do. Console log it. Exactly. OK, and what I'm going to do here for some clarity so we can see what's happening here is I'm going to type in Daisy here. I'm going to hit Add Comment. Oh, look at that. It's fun. Apparently, my Bitwarden is looking at my input and doing stuff with it. That's fun. So I have my input. Why don't we do a console, console.dir for that input? Scroll down, and I can look. And if I go down far enough, and I find oh, oh, oh. value. That's where my data is. This is a property of this input field as attached to the input that we created as a cached element reference. So instead of console logging input, why don't we try console logging input dot what? Value. Um, moving in the right direction. I've now isolated the bananas. So how do I take the bananas and put the bananas in my LI? Text content? Yeah. LI.text content equals, and I can use the info that I've got here to say input dot value. So now let's change our console log and check out what new LI looks like. Moving in the right direction. I've got an LI with bananas in it. Love it. What's our last step? We need to attach it to the UL, right? What element do we want to attach it to? The LI. To LI? The, the UL. The UL. Oh. If I attach it to the UL and I nest it within this UL, it's going to live at the same level as this. Ultimately, we want this. Right? So I'm going to attach it to the UL. But I'm not going to do it by writing the HTML out by hand. That would be, that would be silly. We're going to use JavaScript. So I'll leave my console log there. That's always fun to have a console log in there. We'll take it out before we're done with the, the code. But to do that, we have to do two things. One, we have to select the UL. Right now, we don't have the UL in memory anywhere. We don't have a representation of it in memory. So let's use query selector again, right? Document dot query selector. And let's look for UL. There's only one of them, so this will work. And we can use a method called append child. And append child will add as a child, so nested one space in, whatever I pass to it as an argument which in this case would be new LI. Y'all ready for this? I don't think you're ready for this. Right? This stuff is wild. One problem. This is horrible user experience. When you enter something like into a, a form or a, an input field and you hit a button, what should happen to that input field? It clears. How do I do that? What property was it that was the, the text inside of that field? And it's value to zero? No, sorry, blank um, to um, null. Um, so it's input value. 
it assigned it to empty string. I mean, let's see the console. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. Isn't that neat? I, I thought that was neat. For a summer on this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nandy. Yeah, is there a way to, because I notice when I press add comment again, it'll just add like a, a blank uh, bullet point. Is there a way to make it so that like the user can't do that? Absolutely. You're going to have to do that for your games. Let's go a little off script and, and take care of this. Let's talk about what needs to happen for us to be able to block that click. What would be a way to implement that functionality? I love that you asked that question, Mandy. What if I want to say, if this is blank, the user can't click the button? Yeah, it's just an if statement, right? Okay. To if, Where do I put the if statement? Well, if input.value, where, so you would put it. After line nine. Why not just wrap the whole thing? Yeah. If? Um, yeah. Oh, I guess you're, if you're wanting to use input.value, then yeah, you could do it that way. You'd have to put it down there because you haven't declared it yet. But you could just say if event dot, nope, that won't work because we don't have the event target. You're right, let's put it down here. If input, oh God, imp dot value is equal to what? Empty string, consistency, then we just move our code up. Uh-oh. Oh, equals. equals. Wow. Holy cow. I'm getting too excited about this stuff. There we go. Where's a situation where you would want to do this in a game? Like a browser game. Enter your name. Yeah, that'd be a good, good example. Tell me about what about tic-tac-toe? Where's an implement implementation of this kind of functionality in tic-tac-toe where would i want to disable a user's ability to click once it's already been clicked yeah After they click. exactly if they've already clicked a square if there's already an x or an o in a square a player shouldn't be able to click it you're gonna need to write that into your code mandy just saved you guys some work Uh, what, what's the in initial value of the of this input? The initial I mean, value like the, of it? Like the first time when you open the page, is it like an empty string or is it no now? Let's check it out. I got nothing. Uh, no, it's not a good. Wait. Okay, never mind. I'm just like need to think about it. So. It just shows up as nothing because there's not anything there. Um. So what if I wanted to press enter instead of actually clicking it? Another fantastic question. There are two ways that you can implement that. There's the good way and the bad way. The good way would be to use a form instead of this methodology. And we're going to teach you how to do that tomorrow. The bad way would be to listen for a click and to listen for an enter button on the input. So you'd have to attach an input or an event listener on the input field and listen for a key press of enter. That's bad practice. You don't want to do that because a form will handle doing both of those things for you. But I don't want to get into that today because that's there's more going on there. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Christopher. So the, the input 
that's created when, when you click it, where does, is it important where that goes or just goes in the, the global HTML? Uh, it's, it's, is it going to be in global scope? If I uh, console log, well, I, I mean, I, it'd be kind of hard to do that because it's not going to work, but it, it, it's, it exists within the scope of this, right? Because we're defining it inside of this. It's not going to exist outside of this event listener. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Mike. Uh, sorry, just a little bit confused. Um, the word input in your line seven, mm -hmm. uh, where you put the actual word input, is that, um, is that, um, I guess, is that a parameter that you can call it anything or? Or is an actual, oh, I see. It's you have, the fact that I'm, I'm looking for an input element. It's so, an actual, okay. Yeah, when you're using query selector, you've got, I mean, you have a bunch of options because you can use any CSS selector, right? So if I want to access an input in my CSS, I type input. That's why that works there. If I wanted a button, I type button, which is what we did right here. If I wanted a button with a class name of bananas, I would type what? Dot bananas. Cool. If I wanted the first element with an ID of sandwich, what would I type? Uh. Anybody feel free to answer. First ID or first element with an ID of sandwich. Dot sandwich. Dot sandwich? Or hashtag, hashtag, hashtag sandwich. sandwich. First element with an ID of sandwich. Same as CSS. Cool. I told you all this was fun. We'll take a little break. We'll come back. We're going to talk about event bubbling. Uh, be back in nine minutes. So at uh, 30 past. I have a quick question. Sure. Is there a way to keep your cursor inside that text box after you've cleared the uh, input? Um, if you are hitting enter, yeah, I don't so like, know. Yeah, uh, like, that like that add comment instead of like if you were creating like a list like in this instance instead of having to click inside the text input box every time. Um, because you're clicking, you're taking focus away from the input, so you'd have to shift focus back to that. Um, I don't. Would it be like a focus dot text box? If see. if you. If you built this as a form and did this a little bit differently, then that would yeah. work. And that's what we'll show you tomorrow. Okay. Hey, thank you. Um, or you could just do this. Uh, let's do input dot focus. Come on back, everybody. Got one more thing to talk about, and we will set you loose on your labs. Um, again, we'll open breakout rooms, but we're probably going to end like we're going to push right up today on the uh, edge of timing for the class. So CSS lecture went a little bit longer than I thought it would, but no worries, we are good to go. Um. Everybody, just a second to come back on camera. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about today is uh, event bubbling and why it is so important. Uh, you can see here again, 
throw back to this what the Mega Man 2 reference was for uh, earlier. So props to those who know who Bubble Man is. Uh, but anyway, event bubbling is what happens when an event occurs on an element. Uh, and that event, whether it's listened to on that element or not, bubbles up through the DOM until it reaches the document object. And that may sound confusing. Um, why does it do that? Uh, to give you an example, well, we're going to show you an example here in just a second, but all event listeners registered for the same event, like click, are going to be invoked along the way up the path because of event bubbling. So I'm going to give you an example here, and then we can talk about why this is important and why it's a big deal and why it's going to be useful. Um, the exception here is that if one of those event listeners calls the events stop propagation method, which you're probably not going to use but in this unit, um, we have another example. Once we eventually get to form submissions in React, we have to prevent the page from refreshing, because if you refresh the page in React, then you refresh all your state and bad things happen, but we'll get to that in unit three. Um, the important thing to know here is that the event is going to bubble up. So I'm going to uh, give you an ex a very quick example here. We don't have a CSS file in this, so I'm going to create one. You don't need to do this. Uh, this is just for demo purposes. I don't want to spend 15 minutes trying to get everybody's CSS files configured. So let's, I'm going to do this real quick. And style.css and again i'm just going to show you this example so what i'm going to do is in my html i'm going to put in this little form oh come on oh yeah <laughs> better link the file Derp. Splendid. Okay. So here is a very, very simple representation. This is what this is the kind of CSS you get from me. So brace yourselves. Um, this is a very simple representation of three different elements that are nested within one another. So if you take a look at what we've got here, you have a form inside of which is a div, inside of which is a p tag. And I have, again, I, for this demo, rather than writing three event listeners and three cached element references, this is meant to demonstrate something simple, which is why I don't want you to type this in. This is just, just watch. Um, I use the on click method here and essentially set up an event listener so that when I click on it, I will alert the browser. Like there is going to be a little alert pop up and it's going to say P when I click on the P tag. But I want you to watch what happens here. If I click on that P tag, it says P, which we expected. Then it says div. Then it says form. This is event bubbling. This is what's happening. When I click on this, because of the way that this is set up, this event triggers, which also pops up the chain one. It bubbles up the, the chain one step. And since there's another click listener on this, uh, or on this element, that one will fire too. And since when that finishes, it bubbles up another layer and there's another click listener, it will bubble up and it will trigger this click listener as well. It's confusing. The, the, the concept of bubbling can be confusing at first. Uh, but the reason that it's going to be important for you is, well, let me show you here. If I do on, on the div, right? Does the div, and then it does the form. So it's going to propagate up. And every layer of nesting, it'll go and it'll trigger that same, if there's a listener for it, uh, that event will happen on every single one of those components or elements all the way up to the document. Um, the reason that that's important is if you put an event listener on something like this top level, Right, and you don't have it on the bottom level, like say we get rid of, oops, say we get rid of that, say we get rid of that. I click on the P tag, I'm still gonna get the form. 
So you're still going to see that event. More importantly, you will be able to access the target of what you're clicking because of that event object being bubbled up, up the, uh, the DOM tree. So again, if we had something like a tic-tac-toe board where you have an event listener attached to your board instead of each individual square, this is just one way to do it. You can set your tic-tac-toe up. Well, we actually have a very specific specification for how you're going to set that up. But imagine you have your tic-tac-toe play area and you just have one event listener on that instead of putting one on every single little square, right? You can listen for the click from all of those squares on the one play area. And because you're able to access the target of the event click via the event object, you can see which, uh, which square it is that got clicked. That's why event target, or uh, that's why bubbling is important. Because you're able to access things further up the tree and don't have to put 15,000 event listeners on everything. That makes sense? Kind of. Y'all have had a long day today. I get it. Do you mind just explaining the first, when you first went over, like if, it, if you click it, what happens going up? Sure. So when I click on the P tag here, because I have a click on click event listener set up, right? This is the same thing as this. It's just written differently, right? This isn't JavaScript. This is happening in HTML. So when I cl click on this P tag, it's I have a click listener set up, an event listener listening for a click, and it's going to run alert, which is just a method we have access to. It's going to flash a little stupid pop up on the screen, right? But when I click on this, because of event bubbling, when I click on this uh, P tag, it will fire this click listener and say, okay, this got clicked on. And then this, that event bubbles up to the thing above it in the DOM. Because remember, the DOM is like a big tree, right? The root is the document up at the top. Think of it like a, an upside down tree, I guess. Now, I, whatever, it's a tree, right? You, you have the document up at the top and then there's some stuff on the document and there's more stuff. So it branches out as you go down. So yeah, it's a regular tree. Um, but the, the, all of the stuff that you've got at this lowest level, it's going to, as it propagates up, you have access to that event. So when I click on P here, it says P because it's detected a click here. But once that's done, that, event also bubbles up to the div, which is why I, it says I clicked on the div now. I didn't click again. It's still happening from that first click. And then again on the form. That's because of uh, event bubbling. We're gonna, okay. You're going to so see this a lot more. Button clicks others. Yes. Well, it's, well, clicks it's, it's, the div, clicks the form. It, it, yes. And then if yes. you click the div, that does not activate the P, but it activates the form also. Div after. and the form, yes. Okay, Mike. But, but that's only relevant to the extent that you know, they all have an on-click alert. Right, if I didn't have this alert here, it, it wouldn't do anything. It's still happening. The, the reason I put the alert here is so that you can see that something's happening, right? If I didn't have this click here, it's still technically propagating up through the form. It just doesn't do anything because you don't see it. There's no reason to see it. But the reason I set it up this way is so that you can see that something's actually happening. That event is actually going all the way up the DOM tree, all the way up the document. This will make sense more later. I'm just trying to plant a seed right now, going with the tree analogy, I guess. I'm, I'm planting the seed of being able to understand this down the road. And we talk more about it in detail. Anthony? So if you had multiple paragraph elements, the same thing would happen or would it change? Like this? Yeah. If I click on any of them, it will activate the first, then it will activate the div, then it will activate the form. Cool. Uh, Tom. So you could reverse the order of those and it'll show the to change the order per cl click, right? So if you reversed 
But div below a P. It's not necessarily P. below, it's nested within. So it, it, we, this, this div element isn't below the form, it's in the form. So if I, put, if I did something like this, where I had oh, sorry. form here, and then the div with the P inside of it here, if I click on the form, I'm just going to get the form. But if I click right. on the P, I'm going to get the P, and I'm going to get the div, but not the form. OK, so where it says alert, parentheses, P, and then div right above it, those are reversed, and the order would change, wouldn't it? Um, I mean, they would, but this could be like banana sandwich. It, it's just it's just the text string. It's just the reason I had it set set up that way. Is so it just indicates what we're clicking on. If you okay. click, if you switch those strings, yeah, it would be reverse, but it wouldn't make any sense. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. Um. Uh, event delegation. This we just we literally just talked about this. So instead of having a lot of event listeners, you just put one event listener on an outer element, and you're able to capture all of those events via event delegation and bubbling. Okay, so event bubbling allows us to implement what's known as event delegation. That allows us to register a single event listener that can respond to events triggered by any of its descendants. Okay, much more efficient. So let's, uh, we can go ahead and code this out real quick. Uh, let me get rid of this additional crap that I put in here. And let's go ahead, what is this code doing? Document, yeah, you all uh, click. Okay. It's a named function. Okay, so let's go write a function here where we're gonna put a, an event listener on the UL element. So document dot query selector UL. So we're selecting our UL element here and we're adding an event listener for click. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a function or execute a function called handle click. This is a very familiar thing to see, right? Instead of actually writing an anonymous function there, we're writing a named function that we're defining down here. Function handle click. All right, stop the function up. We know that we're passing the event object to it because it's inside of that callback function. That's one of the things that gets returned. And let's console log event. Okay, we literally did this earlier. So if I click on anything in the UL, it's going to give me that click event. Okay. Notably, and this is where this becomes important. If you look at the target, the target was the LI, even though the event listener is on the UL. Event delegation, bubbling. It's why it's important. So, specifically, if I have a bunch of these, like bananas, flowers, not horses. And I click on any one of these things. You can't see it because of the, right? I clicked on that one. I clicked on what, flowers? And I come down here and I see target, LI. And that I'm, I probably am going to see the text content for that LI as flowers. Or flowers. So because I clicked on that, I put the event listener on the UL. So the event listener isn't on each of these things. The event listener is on the UL, but I have access to the data within each of these things because of uh, the way that that event object is bubbling up. That is where the power is in this. Okay. That would be any UL that you click. Yes. There's only one in this code, though. Multiple LIs, only one UL. Cool. Um, we have 14 minutes left. 
what do we have? Uh, we just have these two things left. We can knock that out. Let's do this together. Write the code to change the color of the text of a clicked comment. So if I click on one of these comments, how do I change the color of that text? How can I access the thing that I'm clicking? We already have our handle click set up, right? We're console logging the event. Let's pseudo target. code it out. I love, uh, yeah, target, right? So what do we need to do? We need to identify the target and then adjust font color. So how do we identify the target? We have event, a target. That gives us what? Let's console log it. Okay, so type some stuff. I click on event, tar uh, click on it, and I get an li. Cool. So it's giving me the actual li. So how do I adjust the property of an li to change the color of the font? There's my li. That style. Style. Dot color. Uh, oh, let's go with something a little bit more bold. Cool. Does it work with multiple things? That's bubbling. It's also possible to remove event listeners. Probably not going to see a ton of that, but you have the ability to do it. Just dot remove event listener. That's not very complicated. Okay. This would remove the click event listener that handle click was registered to. So this is how you add an event listener. This is how you remove the event listener. You still have to pass it the type of event listener that it is to remove it. But we can only do that if it's a named function. Cool. Got a couple of questions and we'll wrap up for the day. I'll read them out. Uh, Christopher, what you got? So I'm just trying to understand this, uh, why you do not have to create EVT or the event because it's created when you call the function handle click and that creates, yes. that creates Whenever, like a temporary UL file. Um, it's not creating a temporary UL because the event.target is what is the element, we're able to just directly change the property of that by using this. Realistically, most of co the code you're going to write is going to actually store that as a variable. So you would probably want to store that as a temporary variable to do something with. But this, this code is just a Can short- Can you do it in this case? Could I? Yeah. Const uh, li to adjust equals event.target, li to adjust dot style dot color is line. It's just shortening it by doing it directly instead of storing it as a variable. Cool. All right, here are some questions. What is the argument that JavaScript passes to an event listener when it calls it? Literally just had that answered. What is the name of the property on the above argument that represents the DOM element that dispatched the event? So what is, I, I almost said it there. 
Uh, and let's say you needed to have an event listener respond to a click on the TDs within a table. So nested within a table. Would you have to have add event, add event listeners on each TD? Support your answer. First up, what is the argument that JavaScript passes to an event listener when it calls it? Angel. I was dreading that I was going to be there. Okay. So this one. Yes, I know. I, I know which one. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. I know we just had it, but I really just can't remember. I'm really so sorry. What argument are we event. passing to that method? The event. The event. Yeah, it's the event object. Exactly. Okay. What is the name of the property on the above argument on event that represents the DOM element that dispatched the event? I guess I got to pick somebody. Min. So what property of event tells me what thing triggered the event? Um, event bubbling. It's happening because of event bubbling. Oh, target target yeah that target property is going to tell us what thing caused the event right so in this case let's again let's go ahead and console log that dot target and you're going to see if i have a couple of these things here right when i click on that let me get rid of my other console log here If I click on that, it's going to show me the LI that dispatched that event. That's the technical phrase for it. the thing that I clicked on, the thing that caused the event to trigger. So event.target. Awesome. And the final question for the day, man, we had a lot of questions today. Let's say you needed to have an event listener respond to a click event on the TDs within a table. TDs are nested within a table, if you're not familiar. Uh, would you have to add event listeners to each TD? Support your answer. Daniel. Um, you would not because of event bubbling from callbacks. Perfect. Great docs here on the event. Good stuff. Ilya. Uh, yeah, I have a question about this example. I mean, with this. Uh delegating what is it called delegating mm -hmm. delegation so when you click on every on each lee element it's like becomes green li lime color right yes but uh because of the event bubbling it should like all delete or not all delete but the whole ul element should become green no it, is mm -hmm. it like that's because point? It, exactly because of that target. So because we're setting the LI that we want to adjust equal to event target, the element that dispatched the event, which is the thing that we clicked on, is what gets set to LI to adjust. And that is what we're adjusting the property of. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We changed. Oh, sorry, yeah, I didn't, didn't uh, okay. notice that. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Cool. Mm -hmm. Kareem? Uh, this is, I just wanted to ask you um, if you don't mind to paste uh, your, your um, JavaScript on yeah. Slack. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is that. Okay. Got like four minutes left. Let me show you guys your lab for the evening. Uh, that's.
labs. Uh, Dom to do lab. Should be a, a not a very heavy lift. Uh, this should this one's a lot easier than a lot of your other labs. So um, also notice we're going to have you turn it into Clippy, which I'm going to talk about here in just a second, super briefly, to just to tell you that we're going to do it tomorrow. Um, but the uh, deliverable is going to have you do a rep of exactly what we did today. Um, you're going to move to your lab directory, create a directory called DOM to do lab, CD into it, create your index HTML, create your JavaScript file, add your script tag, all the same things we've done every time, right? It gives you more information about defer here. Initialize the director, directory as a repository. Hey, we're not giving you instructions on this anymore. Well, that's not fair. Deal with it. You need to learn how to do this. If you haven't learned how to do this stuff on GitHub yet, you're behind. So catch up. Ask for help if you need it, please. We'll help you gladly. Just pop it in the engineering channel. We'll help you get this stuff done. I just don't want to encourage you guys to keep feeding off of our instructions. So we're going to start treating you like real developers. Um, what you're going to need to do is just follow the instructions here. You're going to create an H1 element. Uh, you're going to uh, add an input. You're going to give an ID of your choice, give it an attribute type with a value of text. All of the instructions on this are really well written and easy to follow. So you're going to make a to-do list. Um, only working in your JavaScript file from here. So there's information on what you need to do. Literally rinse and repeat of what we did in the lecture today. So you're able to feed the cats, drink the milk, stay away from horses. Okay. Uh, your bonuses on here are fun and will kind of help you get set up for what we're going to be doing in the future. So, oh, look, look, that got added. I didn't originally write that in there. Don't allow empty items to be added. Reset button so that when you click on it, all of your things go away. Bonus if you can do that in one line of code. Delete an item on click. Ooh, ah. Center all the items on the page using all the CSS stuff we kind of showed you today. Research into the form element, because that's what we're going to start talking about when we get to DOM manipulation, other DOM manipulation stuff. Any questions? Cool. You're going to be turning this in in Clippy. We're going to talk about Clippy tomorrow. So just hold on to your links for that right now and put it. If you need to message it to yourself in Slack so you don't forget about it, that's a neat tool, by the way. If you haven't figured that out yet, you can send yourself a message in Slack and just like jot something down. Super handy. So I would recommend doing that. Once you set up your repo, just shoot yourself a link to it so that you don't have to go look it up later. And tomorrow morning, First thing in the morning, we're going to show you all about Clippy and how to use it. Questions? Sorry, things went a little bit long today. So we'll turn the assignment in with your demonstration of the new yes. homework. Gotcha. Yes. Don't worry about turning anything today. Okay. I'm so excited for you guys to use Clippy. <laughs>